the Design Challenge. My name is Lydia Seacrest, and today we're going to discuss some very important theories in instructional design. And I will demonstrate to you how we can incorporate these design elements in the classroom. The learning objectives of this video are that viewers will be able to explain the cognitive load theory and how to apply it in the classroom. They'll be able to explain the cognitive theory of multimedia learning and how to apply it in the classroom. Explain the signaling spatial contiguity and the coherence learning principles and how to apply them in the classroom and finally explain refutation text and how to apply it in the classroom. We will begin by discussing the cognitive load theory. What is the cognitive load theory? Well, cognitive load theory is an instructional theory built on the premise that the brain can only manage a certain amount of information for a small amount of time. Therefore, when we are designing our classes, then we need to make sure that we are not going overboard on all of our design elements. There are three conditions to the cognitive load theory. These conditions are intrinsic, extraneous, and germane. Intrinsic can be defined as the difficulty of the material, and it's based on the learner's prior knowledge, and it can influence the way that they learn the material. Extraneous cognitive load is defined as how the materials are presented and if they aid in the student's learning. And finally, germane cognitive load is defined as the instructional design that contributes to the student's long-term memory. There are two types of memory. There are working memory and long-term memory. Working memory has limited capacity and we can only hold a certain amount of information in our memory for a short amount of time. Long-term memory is the part of the brain where we store information for a long period of time. Next, we'll discuss the cognitive theory of multimedia learning. The cognitive theory of multimedia learning is a theory built on the premise that individuals learn through words and pictures. According to this theory, people possess separate channels for processing their verbal and auditory information, and that each channel can only process a small amount of data at a time. According to this theory, Meaningful learning involves engaging in appropriate cognitive processes during learning. Cognitive theory of multimedia learning has three assumptions, the dual channel assumption, the limited capacity assumption, and the active processing assumption. The dual channel assumption states that humans possess two separate channels that process their auditory and their visual information. The limited capacity assumption states that individuals can only hold a certain amount of information in either their dual channel or sorry a certain amount of information in either of the dual channels at one time and finally the active processing assumption states that individuals actively engage in cognitive process to construct representations of their experiences there are three multimedia learning principles that connect to the cognitive load theory they are the signaling principle which is a multimedia principle where important content is indicated by using cues. Cues can come in the form of bold print, using arrows to highlight important information, color coding words, or sections of information. The signaling principle connects to the cognitive theory of multimedia because it reduces extraneous load. Extraneous cognitive load happens when instructional materials are presented in a way that does not aid in the student's learning. Here is an example of how you can use a signaling principle in your science classroom. As a class, today we're going to read a paragraph on solids and liquids. When we are done reading, we will have a class discussion on what we learned from this paragraph. And the paragraph is as follows. What do shoes, paper, and cheese all have in common? They are all solids. Solids are things that have a shape of their own. They do not flow like liquids do. Computer trees and soccer balls are also solids. Liquids do not keep their shape. As liquids um, can be poured into a container, it will take the container shape. Some examples of liquids are water and milk. Solids and liquids have something in common. They are both states of matter. Matter is everywhere, and it is anything that takes up space and has mass. Mass is a measure of how much matter is in an object, and all objects are made of matter. Now, can you give me an example of a solid? Those can be trees, cheese, and soccer balls. Can you give me an example of a liquid? It's water and milk. What is matter? Well, matter is anything that takes up space and has mass. What is mass? It is the measure of how much 
matter is in an object. As you can see from this simple lesson, each important topic was highlighted in a different color and was bold in print. This signals the student to the important information of the text. The next principle we will discuss is the spatial contiguity principle. This is a multimedia principle where matching words and pictures are near each other on the page or screen. The spatial contiguity principle connects the theory of multimedia learning by reducing extraneous cognitive load and helps with essential processing. It allows the learners to organize the important information of the lesson and keeps them from shifting their focus from the important information. This is important because it helps students retain information using their working memory. Since working memory has a limited capacity, it keeps students from, from becoming overwhelmed. Here is an example of how you can use the spatial contiguity principle in a science classroom. This is a diagram on the water cycle. The water cycle is the path that all water follows as it flows around the earth. The sun's heat causes glaciers and snow to melt into liquid water. This water goes into oceans, lakes, and streams. This is known as melting or runoff. Water is able to get into the atmosphere two ways. The first way is known as evaporation, which occurs when liquid water on earth's surface turns into water vapor into the atmosphere. The second way water gets into the Earth's atmosphere is through transpiration. Transpiration is when water from the plants and trees enter the atmosphere. As the water vapor rises into the Earth's atmosphere, the cool air of the atmosphere will cause the water vapor to turn back into a liquid, creating clouds. This process is known as condensation. Finally, when the cloud becomes full of liquid water, it will then fall from the sky in the form of rain, snow, sleet, or hail. This is known as precipitation. Rain and snow, sleet and hail, will then fall into lakes and streams, and the process of the water cycle will begin all over again. For this example, you can see that the corresponding words match the diagram. So where it says precipitation, precipitation was labeled, and where it says condensation, condensation was happening, and all of the other elements of the diagram were on the page so that students can understand. The final principle that we're going to discuss is the coherence principle, which is a multimedia message where extraneous material is excluded. The coherence principle connects to the cognitive theory of multimedia learning by reducing extraneous processing. This is helpful to learners because the instructional design only includes important graphics, text, and narration that supports their learning goals. This principle highlights the important information for learners. Here is an example of how you can use the coherence principle in a science classroom. Today, we're gonna to talk about the life cycle of a butterfly. There are four stages to the life cycle of a butterfly. The first stage is known as the egg stage. This is when an adult female will fly and lay eggs on a plant or a leaf. Depending on the species of butterfly, they will lay their eggs in the spring, summer, or fall. Once the egg is hatched, it will begin eating the plant or leaf for food. This process begins the larva caterpillar stage of the life cycle. During this stage, the caterpillar will eat as much as it can to store food for energy to be used later when it becomes an adult. When a caterpillar is fully grown and stops eating, it enters the pupa chrysalis stage of the life cycle. Depending on the species of butterfly, the pupa will form its chrysalis on a leaf branch or even bury it underground. The chrysalis will stay formed for two weeks to a month depending on the species of butterfly. During this stage is when the pupa undergoes metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is a transformation process that occurs when the caterpillar turns into an adult butterfly. During this process is when the pupa begins to form legs, wings, eyes, and other parts of the adult butterfly. When the caterpillar has gone through metamorphosis, it will begin to work its way out of the chrysalis, and this will begin the final stage of the life cycle, which is the adult stage. The adult stage of the life cycle of a butterfly lasts approximately two weeks, and during this time, the adult female will fly and plant, fly from plant to plant to find the perfect place to lay their eggs. Once the female lays her eggs, she will die, and then the entire cycle will begin again. For this example, you will see that the diagram was labeled for each stage, and the definition fit the picture for each stage. In order for these theories to be beneficial to our students' conceptual change, 
sorry. In order for these theories to be beneficial to our students, conceptual change has to occur. The three principles we discussed connect to conceptual change model because conceptual change is defined as learning that changes an individual's existing conceptions of a topic. Learning from conceptual change is not about learning a new skill or learning new facts. Learners can use conceptual change to solve problems, explain information, and describe the world around them. Finally, conceptual change can be used to address a learner's prior knowledge and it can be used to address any misconceptions they have about a concept or topic. An example of how to use conceptual change is through the use of refutation text. Refutation text is used to address students' misconceptions and is a text that includes elements of argumentation. Here is an example of how you can use refutation text in a science classroom. You would want to begin the lesson by having students read this text and then follow it by a class discussion on what they read. Additionally, you would want to do maybe a follow-up assessment to see, or even a pre-assessment before the lesson starts to see what the students know about it, and then do a, a post-assessment where they uh, will show you or demonstrate to you that they changed. So in this refutation text, this is about Newton's law of motion. And it is about a man who rides a tiny motorcycle during the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. And to the spectators below, he looks like he's, you know, in a lot of danger, but the man who's riding the bicycle, his name is Bello, has a secret. He used science to help to keep him safe. And as the students continue to read this um, refutation text, it will go on and it will give them definitions on gravity, it will give them definitions on motion, and then you will be able to see in your post-assessment what they were discussing. And finally, um, to end this video, how is the cognitive theory of multimedia learning similar and different from cognitive load? Well, they are similar because they both discuss how the brain has limited capacity and should not be overloaded with large amounts of information at a time. Both theories believe that it's important to bring instructional element designs to the classroom that are beneficial to the students. They are different because the cognitive theory of multimedia learning deals with learning with pictures and because it discusses the dual process assumptions. Thank you for tuning into this video.